Hello and welcome to Our American States, a podcast from the National Conference of State Legislatures. This podcast is all about legislatures, the people in them, the policies, process, and politics that shape them. I'm your host, Ed Smith. I began then very early on in my career to go to local community-based mental health centers, drug treatment providers, faith leaders, and say, you're interacting with the same people I am. What do you know that I don't? That was Jack Charlier, a former law enforcement officer who's a pioneer in the area of deflection, a set of preventive measures aimed at reducing reliance on law enforcement as we respond to the mental health crisis in this country. He's one of my guests on the podcast. People having a mental health crisis in this country are more likely to encounter law enforcement than to receive treatment. And because of a lack of other resources, police sometimes spend a fifth of their time dealing with people with a mental illness. Studies indicate that more than 80% of people in jails with mental illness do not receive adequate treatment. Charlier discussed how deflection programs work, offered advice for legislators in crafting legislation, and discussed his view that a provision of the Medicaid law that affects reimbursement for some treatment, known as the IMD exclusion, should be eliminated. For the second portion of the program, my guests are two lawmakers, Representative Leslie Harrod, a Democrat from Colorado, and Representative Dwight Tosh, a Republican from Arkansas. Both have worked on legislation in their states to better address this issue. Here's our discussion, starting with Jack Charlier. Jack, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Adam. Glad to be here today. Hey, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're going to discuss the mental health crisis this nation is facing. But before we get into that, I wonder if you could just spend a minute telling our listeners about your background and how you came to do the work that you're doing now. Sure, that sounds good and always a great place to start. So three big strands of my background that are really relevant to our conversation today around Mental Health Awareness Month and the topic of deflection. First, I come from the world of law enforcement uh, in Illinois. I was a state parole officer or district commander and finished up my time time as a deputy chief with Illinois State Parole. And what that did uh, and into this conversation today brings in kind of the enforcement side of the question. What are those elements where law enforcement is interacting with people on the streets and what does that look like? But the second strand that quickly emerged out of that is the realization that I had for which I take no credit other than knowing that the training I had received about enforcement, other words, uh, getting at crime reduction that way wasn't sufficient for what I was seeing and encountering on the streets, which were issues of mental health, drug use, homelessness, and all the attendant issues. And so the second strand is I began then very early on in my career to go to local community-based mental health centers, drug treatment providers, faith leaders, and say, you're interacting with the same people I am. What do you know that I don't? And from that began my education, thanks to others, on understanding mental health, and on understanding drug addiction, understanding homelessness, understanding domestic violence, things I had not been taught on from the enforcement side. So you put enforcement together then with a really beginning strong understanding of clinical behavior, health, uh, and social service world. And then finally, the third strand that will play into the conversation today about deflection and responding best to issues of mental health uh, is that I am a trained community organizer out of the Saul Linsky School in Chicago. Now, community organizer is not an activist or an advocate. Those are elements sometimes that we use, but it is about bringing together the institutions and the people and communities to solve shared problems and challenging challenges that those communities are facing. So those three strands together will get us right to the topic of deflection today. So you mentioned it is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month and a good time to take on this topic. One of the things that I think many people find kind of amazing is that someone who's having a mental health crisis has a better chance of encountering law enforcement than they do any appropriate treatment providers. Why is this the case? And what is it that is being done about it? What, what's from the, the, the big view? What, what can we do about what is being done about it? Certainly, it's a multitude of reasons of why it is that law enforcement is on scene, present in responding to mental health issues. The first one that's really obvious and easy to get at, of course, is we are all trained to dial 911. And so 911 has become the default across the United States for much more than emergencies. The second reason, and this is very important because everybody might not know this, even though it seems obvious, social services runs 
generally 8.30 to 5, police run 24-7. So even if you did not have the desire to call 911, the reality is there's often nobody else to call and certainly outside of, and it might not be 8.30 to 5, it might be 7 to 7 uh, on Monday through Friday only, you really don't have anybody else to call. So you end up right back at that first point or at least calling the police, even if not on 911 and the police get dispatched. But that leads us right to the 988 uh, rollout that's coming later this year, in July 2022, across the country, the beginning of the rollout for 988 to uh, begin to untrain us to call 911 uh, for everything that goes on uh, in regards to, say, a mental health issue that's happening. Uh, But those first two reasons are really it. It's the number that we all know. We all pick it up, dial it. Kids are taught it in school, and so it's built in. And secondly, even if you wanted to call someone else until 988 comes in, and that will take quite a few years for that entire structure, you're going to end up probably back in 911 or something close to that that reaches the police, maybe fire and EMS too, to be sure. Um, and that's going to roll you right back there because the social services isn't operating 24-7. And one of the realities that people might not be familiar with of why it is that uh, some law enforcement counters w- at times with some people who have mental health challenges uh, presents a challenge in and of itself uh, are these two reasons. First of all, when an officer is on the street um, and she is giving commands or instructions or guidance to someone, a person with mental health, possibly with substance use disorder or possibly a person with using drugs in addition to that, Um, might not understand or be responsive to the commands. So from the officer's perspective, she's giving instructions and guidance to someone, and that person is not responding in the way that the officer needs or wants them to respond. That might not be obvious to a lot of folks if you've not seen or been part of these encounters. The second thing that happens is that officers might misread at times, depending on their background and understanding and knowledge of mental health, might misread the interactions with someone who has a mental health issue, again, possibly also with drug use on top of it, which is very common, the co-occurring part of this. And so they misread those actions that that person is doing, as well as possibly statements they're making as a public safety threat towards the officer, towards her partners, or towards the community. So you get non-responsiveness to the commands, instructions, or guidance given. Then you get a perception that this is some kind of public safety issue unfolding, you put those together and you land at the place of why it is that the field of deflection has emerged onto the scene very rapidly in the United States after a a lot of innovation going on very rapidly in the last uh, seven years. The field of deflection, right, writ large, which is a whole range of early upstream prevention type of efforts and initiatives, as well as those that focus just on crisis Although in deflection, we don't want you to focus just on crisis. We want to get early upstream prevention, as I said, um, and these are community-based initiatives. What we're trying to get at is situations where the encounters with police are reduced when appropriate and handled by others for whom the issue of a person not responding to instruction or commands is not an issue and for whom their background, experience, education, lived experience will allow them to see and understand what's going on not through the lens of a challenge to public safety, because most of the time with mental health, there is no actual challenge to public safety, but through the lens of a clinical engagement approach. So what does that look like uh, on the street? Um, how, how is that different from the scenario you just described where the, the officer there is there, she, she's trying to give instructions? Is there someone else with the officer who, who, who helps with that? So in deflection, again, the field of deflection writ large, these broad-based, community-based initiatives where the community is deciding how it is that we're going to respond to issues of behavioral health, of mental health, of drug use, um, in a way that fits with how our community would like to see that happen. So on an actual kind of granular level, there are a variety of options and approaches that can be taken in deflection. The word co-responder, which most people didn't know two years ago, now probably a lot of people listening to this uh, podcast will know the word co-responder. That implies some kind of law enforcement officer, fire or EMS with somebody who has behavior health background, social work, peer, person with lived experience going side by side, often in real time. There's another, uh, what we call the three prongs of deflection. One is co-responder. The other one is community responder. Well, you will have no first responder. So you will have no police, no fire, no EMS. 
but uh, might be two people, it might be one person um, who has lived experience, who is a peer. And I cannot say enough, especially to your audience, of the value of people with lived experience and peers being brought in professionally. Their experience is extremely relevant to this conversation of deflection and mental health awareness month and responding to issues of mental health. But so in a community responder, you have no first responders, I said, but you do have one to two or some kind of team responding, if you will, possibly not in real time necessarily, you know, no lights and sirens, not that kind of thing, to people who have mental health challenges. And that's two people showing up dressed however they're dressed and really prepared and ready for it. And then there are times where, in fact, you do have more of a police responder approach, and there's several models out there of that, where you will have a police officer responding with peers recovery, or sometimes the police alone, right? Depends on the ability and the resources of a jurisdiction, the police alone responding. And that's in those cases where training and education and background of the officer, because she's alone in that response. uh, So she has to carry all that weight. There's nobody with her. That is critical for that type of response. And then the other part to your question is, we think of that as what we call in deflection, the point of encounter, the POE. The POE is where our minds go, where smartphone cameras capture video of. But in reality, the trick of deflection and where the actual work of deflection happens in responding to people with mental health issues and the success of these initiatives isn't at the point of encounter. We call that the one-tenth point of deflection. It's at the nine-tenths of deflection of everything that happens after the point of encounter to relentlessly engage with the person, get close to them, stay close to them, provide them support, guidance, motivation, help them move through the system, help them follow up referrals, take them there, walk through them with uh, with it, whether they're in services or not and be with them. That's really the nine tenths of deflection interventions that matter. So the response to your question, your listeners Uh, on this podcast, we'll think of, oh, co-responder, community responder, police responder. But because of their legislative role, it's really what comes after that, that nine-tenths part of deflection where the interventions that actually cause change in people's lives happen. Well, I think you're uh, you're right that most of us do think of just that point of encounter as being the issue. And uh, excellent point that this is really something that's far more involved and takes a lot more follow-up. Many of us are aware that this is happening because we started to read about it after all the protests and George Floyd and all that sort of thing. It certainly brought a lot of talk about how to change the way that police work. But how much of this is actually happening? Is this going on in a lot of communities around the country? And Most of us are just not aware of it. Most are not aware of it, or I'll say it better. Prior to the last two years, like anything else, unless you were in the field of deflection. So for example, I, I am one of the co-founders of both the field and movement of deflection. And so for the last seven years, I get to do this stuff. But if you weren't in that up until two years ago, like anything else, you probably weren't paying a lot of attention to it. Death could be true of any profession, any field. So prior to two years ago, absolutely, not only was deflection on the move, it was developing in a number of sites that have existed. Let's take, I'm going to take actually the substance use disorder side of this, went from just a handful of deflection sites only five, six, seven years ago to well over a thousand sites. What's happened in the last two years, and very important that uh, the audience for this podcast, so legislators are paying attention to this now, is the public demand for deflection has substantially increased. That's the big difference. The awareness of deflection, whether it's for mental health, whether it's for drug use, whether it's for issues of homelessness, whatever it might be, the range of things where we want to leverage police, fire, and EMS contacts and the systems that are needed to address these issues, it's the awareness and the interest and the demand and desire for those that has absolutely changed. And on the mental health side, the biggest change has been twofold. So on the People who use drug side, the substance use disorder side, it's been just a growth and scaling of the programs very rapidly. On the mental health side, where some of these initiatives have existed for quite a while, but kind of on their own, you have seen a much greater focus specifically on mental health crisis response, right? Because that has been in the public eye quite a bit. So that's one area of growth uh, that has really accelerated in the last two years. And the other one, and this is really good because in the field of deflection, we have talked about uh, the program in Oregon, uh, CAHOOTS. Everybody now knows about CAHOOTS probably uh, in your listening audience. But prior to two years ago, a small number of us knew about CAHOOTS. 
Cahoots falls into generally this thing we call the community responder form of deflection. As I said earlier, where uh, there are no first responders in it, but you have behavior, health, lived experience. They're probably working with first responders behind the scenes. In fact, they are in some way, shape, or form, but they're not the ones arriving at the scene. That's been the second big development on the mental health side in these last two years. So, Jack, tell me about these five pathways. Uh, you had mentioned this and uh, alluded to this earlier. So can you break that down for us on, uh, on how those five pathways work? When we look at the field of deflection in the United States, and that's what we've been doing is this field and this movement has been rapidly growing, what we find are basically five different ways that you can do deflection or hybrids of the five different ways. And that matters for a few reasons. One is for legislators, uh, we would prefer that you introduce legislation that covers all five pathways. And so the White House model deflection law is a way of looking and understanding how do you do that legislatively and from a policy standpoint, instead of doing it from a single approach. In other words, finding something somewhere in the country, maybe in your own state that you think is good, but there are other ways to do it. And so the five pathways are things like self-referral, active outreach, naloxone plus, officer prevention, officer intervention pathways. And what you're doing is then you're setting up your local county, parishes, villages, cities, townships to have access to the full range of deflection that might be possible that best fits their local context, their local resources, and the challenges that they are trying to address or problems they're trying to solve versus doing something on a pilot, for example, even a multi-site pilot in a state off of a single approach or a single way of understanding deflection, whatever that deflection is doing in the mental health space. And then that's all that you give your state is that one approach. Jack, our audience, of course, includes legislators and legislative staff. What do you think their role is in taking on this mental health challenge? State legislators have a key role in building out the growth and development of deflection in their state. As it stands now, villages, counties, municipalities, parishes can do deflection on their own right now. But the state must set up the framework for the legislative and policy elements that are needed to make this go. Fund engagement, relentless engagement and outreach. Often, the funding streams right now in the United States are funding clinical services only. In other words, I have to go out and provide a clinical service to a person who has a mental health issue. But there's lots of other things going on with that person that might not fall in the clinical realm, but for which, absent that, the clinical intervention isn't going to have the impact it needs, or it might not have any impact at all. So fund engagement and fund outreach, even if no clinical work is being performed. Lived experience, peers, that's where they come in. Because if we don't get to the folks early through outreach and engagement, we're then only waiting for the crisis to happen. Treatment capacity, this answers the deflect to what question. Right? So what are the resources I have in my community, Jack, if I build a deflection initiative, what are the resources I have that I can then use once someone is deflected from that one-tenth point of encounter to the nine-tenth, what do I have? Treatment capacity matters because once you build deflection, they will come. Officers, fire, EMS, and community response teams will absolutely begin to use it, and so you need the resources there. And finally, the last thing I'm going to say, and I know this is for state audiences, uh, but they interact with uh, federal folks, is the IMD exclusion is a huge, huge element that we need to address in the United States. I won't get into that more. Your listeners will know it. But in terms of treatment capacity, which I was just talking about, the change in the IMD exclusion at the federal level will help and benefit the states to expand their treatment capacity in this area. The greatest change that could happen would be changing the IMD exclusion. Well, Jack, thank you so much for sharing your expertise on this topic. It's actually, I, I think, a very positive discussion because there's a lot that can be done that we all know is a, a serious problem. Take care. Thanks, Ed. I'll be back right after this with our discussion with our two legislators. NCSL's 50-state bill tracking database makes researching legislation quick and easy. From agriculture to vaping and everything in between, simply select your topic, bill status, or keyword to learn about legislation across the country. Visit our website at ncsl.org and put the words state and tracking in the search bar or go to the research tab and select bill tracking. 
Let the 50 State Bill Tracking Database work for you. Try it out today. Representatives Herod and Tosh, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Well, thank you both for coming on the show to talk about ways to reduce reliance on law enforcement as we respond to the mental health crisis in this country. And I'd like to ask both of you how you came to focus on this issue. Representative Herod, why don't you start by telling us why this is important to you? Sure. Well, this is important to me for um, many reasons. Uh, Previously, before I served on the Joint Budget Committee, I served as the chair of the Finance Committee and the vice chair of the Judiciary Committee. And I quickly realized how much funding was going into our prisons and jails, specifically for offenders who have severe mental illness or uh, substance use disorder. We weren't treating folks in the way that we needed to. In fact, Colorado is 47th in the nation for mental health resources. So it's no wonder that we're seeing uh, complications showing up in our prison system. We're not doing enough on the front end. Uh, And so it was important for me that we change that, right, and that we provide more mental health resources to people before they get into the criminal justice system uh, and actually support, support folks who need it, ensure that we're actually bringing down public uh, safety concerns. Additionally, though, I will say personally, it's important to me because my sister was caught up in the same system. She has served 30 years in and out of prison, 30 years of her life in and out of prison uh, that really stemmed from trauma, addiction and mental health challenges that were never addressed. When she found her way out, she found her way back in because she never got the help that she needed. We see that every single day. And with Colorado being one of the top states in the nation for recidivism, meaning more people commit crimes and go back into the system, we know it's all connected. And so it was important for me and, quite frankly, my colleagues in the General Assembly to prioritize mental health and substance misuse treatment so that we can really start to get a hold of our prison population, our budget, but also so that we can ensure that Colorado uh, is prioritizing public safety. Representative Tosh, how about for you? Uh, I know you were in law enforcement before coming to the legislature, and I'd assume that that experience brought you face to face with this issue pretty frequently. Yes, sir, it did. I, I spent 37 years in, in law enforcement, and I guess during that 37 years, I probably encountered, I guess, about every conceivable situation one could imagine concerning the interaction between law enforcement and those experiencing a mental health issue. And of course, you know, you always ask yourself in law enforcement and the dilemma that law enforcement is faced with when you encounter someone that's having a mental health issue, you know, what do you do? Like the other representative just said, public safety is always the primary uh, priority in that situation. But just to share with you a quick story to hopefully make my point, back when I was a young trooper, I had... uh, gone to an emergency room at a hospital to follow up on a traffic accident. While I was there, the doctor pulled me aside and he said, we need your help. So we've got an individual here at the emergency room. And uh, he just said, hey, he doesn't have a medical problem. We've tried to convince him of that. He refuses to leave. And uh, he's really causing a problem here in the emergency room for the other staff members and for the patients that we're trying to treat. So what do you do in those situations? And here in Arkansas, we had a statute on the books that allowed law enforcement officers, when when we encountered those type of situations, that statute read the language in it was arresting and confining someone that was insane. I remember on that particular occasion that night, I ended up taking that person to the county jail and charged him under that statute and confined him for being insane. And of course, his They hired an attorney, and while we were in court, well, the defense attorney, I remember, asked me the question. He said, well, you know, Trooper Tosh said, just uh, share with the court uh, what training you have, what degrees do you have in dealing with mental health issues, and uh, just tell us what your background is and how you have the expertise to make the assessment or the evaluation between someone that's sane and someone that's insane, according to this statute. And obviously, the answer to that is, I don't. And of course, uh, at that point, he made a motion to uh, to the court to dismiss the charge because I didn't have the training to make that decision. And I remember the judge looked over at me and he said, uh, before I rule on this case, he said, Trooper, is there anything you'd like to respond to that to the court in response to the defense attorney's uh, 
motion. And I said, yes, sir, I would. And I explained to the judge, and, and I think this is the position most law enforcement officers have always been in when it comes to dealing with mental health issues uh, with individuals, is that uh, public safety is first. And just like there at the emergency room, I had an obligation and, as a respons- and a responsibility as a law enforcement officer to the safety of that person that was having those mental health issues and also a responsibility to those people there in the emergency room. I told the judge, I said, you know, Your Honor, I, I don't have a background in, in, in uh, any degrees as far as making those assessments and evaluations of an individual. But, Your Honor, I said, you know, I can't play a piano either, but I can tell you when someone is playing one that is badly out of tune. And the judge, uh, he considered that, and, and I, you know, and I appreciated that. Representative Tosh, let me stay with you for a minute. After you entered the legislature, you worked to expand training and alternatives for law enforcement officers responding to a mental health crisis. How did that happen? Uh, I was sworn in in January of 2020. 20- 15 uh, as a state legislator. In the same time, we had a new governor. He was sworn in, and we started our legislative session. And two weeks into that session, the governor had several of us that were newly elected over to the governor's mansion for uh, for dinner. And I remember after dinner, he went around the table and asked each one of us what was a what was a priority for us as as new legislators or something that we had a passion about that we wanted to try to get accomplished. When he got to me, he said, Representative Tosh, what about you? And I conveyed to him that uh, one of my, my, my passion was to do something about mental health issues and the interaction with law enforcement and that we needed to come up with a plan to address that. I just said, you know, we, you know, law enforcement is dealing with mental health issues, people with mental health issues all the time. And I said, we're using our county jails to house these individuals. I said, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to our court system. I said, and we're occupying those beds with people with mental health issues when they should be reserved for people that's actually committed a criminal act. And he asked me what, uh, how I would go about, what proposals I would make to address that. And I said, well, I really believe that what we need to do is we need to look at building some mental health uh, units around this state and training law enforcement officers in identifying those people that have mental health issues versus those that have truly committed a, uh, a criminal act. And I just remember the governor said, well, that sounds like it's going to be pretty expensive. And I said, yes, sir, it probably will be. Uh, but I think the dividends that this state will receive from that will be worth every dime that that we invest. And uh, I'm not sure that the governor didn't already have that project on his radar or if I planted the seed or what. But nothing happened during that legislative session. But during the uh After that, the governor uh, established a pilot program with two of the largest counties that we have in Arkansas, and that pilot program was to identify the number of people that were being brought into our county jails that were experiencing a uh, serious or persistent mental health issue, and even uh, startling to me was when those statistics came back, 31% of the people that were being brought to our county jails, were experiencing some type of serious mental health issue. And of course, from there, that uh, got a lot of attention from uh, the legislators. And we moved forward in the 2017 uh, session, and uh, we uh, uh, passed a bill that would, uh, which I'll discuss further in this interview, hopefully, the establishment of four crisis intervention units strategically located throughout the state. But also part of that bill, to address your question, was it also provided that there would be three levels of training for law enforcement officers. We're moving in the right direction for law enforcement to be able to identify these individuals and uh, and to be able to uh, to take them uh, to one of these crisis intervention units and uh, let them spend the night there instead of a night in the county jail. Great. Well, we're going to get to those uh, those triage units. But Representative Herod, let me switch over to you. You were involved in bringing the STAR program to Denver, which, as I understand, is modeled on the CAHOOTS program out of Eugene, Oregon. And I wonder if you could tell us more about that program and why you wanted to bring it to Colorado. 
as I mentioned earlier, Colorado spends far too little on mental health and substance misuse services and far too much on incarceration. So in Colorado and in Denver particularly, uh, I took off my legislative hat and decided to run a ballot measure called Caring for Denver. Caring for Denver provides $35 million annually for mental health and substance misuse services right here in the city and county of Denver. We ran a ballot measure, and even though we were told we couldn't do it, we did, uh, and the measure passed with 70% of the vote. Coloradans support getting people help themselves, their friends, their families, their neighbors. So what we did with that funding was decide, okay, part of this money will go to alternatives to jails so that no one has to touch the criminal justice system. Because what we know is that it's not necessarily only people with severe mental illness or those who are unfit for trial that are, that are committing crimes. A lot of our crimes are low-level offenses, stealing out of cars, carjacking, things like that, because people are paying for their substance misuse disorder or because people are, are dealing with uh, their mental health disorder and living, uh, living on the streets. Every single one of those people do not need, does not need prison right, to become uh, productive members of society or to break their addiction. Instead, they need help. And so I was asked by Commander, now Chief Pazin, to go to Eugene, Oregon and to see Cahoots. And I got to tell you, I thought he was sneezing. I was like, what do you mean Cahoots? What, what, what are you talking about? Uh, and he said it was an amazing program out of Eugene, Oregon that got people help before they reached the system. And so I went out there and I saw firsthand on a ride along how Cahoots worked. When someone calls 911 because someone needs help, uh, which they do. Uh, in Eugene, Oregon, instead of getting only a law enforcement response, they get a mental health professional and an EMT on mental health calls. So I went to someone's house who had a weapon, a box cutter, uh, who was threatening to kill himself. Uh, and I saw Cahoots work in tandem with law enforcement to talk that person down, to get them help, to get them stabilized on their medication, to stay on scene for a total of probably about two hours as that person stabilized and got them the services that they needed. And I thought, wow, this actually works. We could bring this to Denver. And so we created STAR, Support Team Assisted Response, right here in Denver. Caring for Denver funded it with about uh, $270,000 start to get a van and to pay for staff to actually ride around, uh, get people the help they need needed, and to tie this service into 911. And it has been extremely successful uh, in our first year of STAR, we have had zero negative instances with law enforcement. We have had zero referrals to jail, and we have actually had law enforcement come to us and ask for help on calls, which has been great. The partnership has been phenomenal, and it's been working. So we've taken the STAR model now and brought that to the state capitol. We, have now have, we now have funding resources for cities and counties across the state of Colorado who want to have uh, crisis intervention teams that want to have a uh, star like teams and co-responders to ensure that people are getting the access to the help that they need and not the over reliance on the criminal justice system, which we know is just not working. So Representative Herod, I know you're a little short on time and I want to make sure I ask you about other legislative actions in the past couple of years related to changing how Colorado funds and responds to the mental health crisis. Are there other things you'd like to highlight in that area? Absolutely. Uh, this year, we are actually investing a million, uh, upwards of $500 million in mental health and substance misuse services right here in Colorado. We're using uh, the federal ARPA dollars to do that. Uh, we are saying that mental health needs to be a priority, uh, whether it's young people in our schools, whether it's people who have had access to, or touches in the criminal justice system, or those who don't. We will get people the help that they need. It's my goal and vision that regardless of if you're in crisis or not, that every single Coloradan has a place to go when they need help, when they need someone to talk to, or when they are also in crisis. That's what we're doing here with this funding, and that's what Denver is also doing with Caring for Denver, and we're very excited to make that happen. We're also dealing right now with the fentanyl crisis. Um, as we know, fentanyl is affecting a lot of our states. Some, some have, have been dealing with this for a while. Colorado is dealing with it right now. And we are saying that we are going to prioritize treatment, um, not just uh, felonization uh, or uh, jail or prisons for folks who need it, for folks who are addicted to fentanyl or other substances. And so we are shifting our priorities here in the state. And we are seeing, I think, positive outcomes from that work. 
Representative Tosh, I wonder, we talked a little bit about the triage centers. Could you talk a little bit more about that and and kind of what's the goal of that and how those are functioning? Like I said, uh, Ed, in 2017, when we uh, when we passed 423, we appropriated during that uh, during that act, we we allocated money to build those four uh, crisis intervention units across to be strategically located throughout Arkansas. Uh, we have one in the northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast part of the state. We appropriated 1.6 million dollars per unit for the construction of those units. And we still fund those, and we do that out of our general revenue. It is expensive, but I'm, I'm telling you, it's a bipartisan effort. Uh, there's been no pushback from it. We've got everybody on board. Uh, those units, uh, like I said, are lo- strategically located. Uh, it has allowed law enforcement now for uh, a place to be able, when uh, when they interact with someone with a mental health issue, they now have a place to take those individuals to get them the treatment that they need instead of taking them to the county. County jail, and uh, those units have a, a staff of about 20 people. Uh, they're made up of a registered nurse. Uh, they're made up of at least two uh, psychiatric registered, registered nurses, also mental health experts, and other staff members. And like I said. We, through the Department of Human Services, we're funding those units uh, out of general revenue uh, to uh, $130,000 a month for each unit. We just recently uh, uh, finished up with our fiscal session here in Arkansas. We increased the funding for those units from $350 a day per uh, per patient that they see up to $570 a day uh, because we realize that uh, how extremely important it is that these uh, these units be utilized to help people are in these difficult times with mental health issues. So you can see from that, and it's working. Uh, for uh, I, Since all four units in 2017, uh, when we authorized the building of those crisis intervention units, we had the first one to, to be completed and opened its doors in 2018. Two others followed in 2019, and then the fourth one was completed in 2020. And since the opening of those four crisis intervention units uh, here in Arkansas, we've had uh, uh, around 7,200 people with mental health issues that have gone through that have been uh, have gone through those units. And I think. Uh, talking about law enforcement, I think what's really impressive about this and how this has worked really helping law enforcement is that 2,400 of those individuals that have visited the, the crisis intervention units, 2,400 of them were diverted there by law enforcement officers. So you can see it's really been a a, a great effort among uh, mental health professionals and law enforcement officers in addressing this issue. Yeah, that does sound like it's been very successful. You know, as we get ready to wrap up here, you all know, of course, that your colleagues are our audience. And I always like to ask people about lessons learned. And I'm going to ask Representative Herod, uh, maybe she could start out and say what advice she would share with her colleagues around the country. Absolutely. What I would say is think about being innovative, you know, think about trying new things, always work in partnership with law enforcement. But a lot of us have the same goals in mind, which is to keep people off the streets, out of jail, not committing crimes, and getting the treatment and and their needs met, right? The treatment they deserve. And so work together to find creative solutions to make that happen. What I will say is in Colorado, you don't have to do much to convince one of our sheriffs or chiefs that we need to have more mental health services available in their counties or even in their jails and jurisdictions. And so take that. And, and, and work together to make something, I think, quite transformative happen. It's important that we don't over rely on the criminal justice system to get people the help that they need. Look outside of that. Get people help early, you know, before they commit crimes, before they're in the system. And don't wait until they commit a high level crime before they get access to services. If you have any of those barriers in your state, remove them and ensure that people do get that help. And also work with therapists, work with with insurance, work with as many folks as you can to ensure that mental health is a priority. And I guarantee You'll see the impacts not only on the, the lives of your of your um, constituents, but also on your state budget when it comes to corrections and jails and your child welfare systems as well. Let's get people the help that they need and let's save lives and help people thrive. 
Representative Tosh, uh, how about you? You get the last word here. What what would you tell your colleagues around the country? I would say that I, I realize that what we what we've been able to do here in Arkansas it is expensive, and like I said, we funded this out of general revenue. But I think what we've been able to really accomplish is that we've taken people that have mental health issues and we've re- we've removed them from the uh, from the criminal justice system, and we have them a, a facility now that they can do, go to and get the treatment that they need. It's 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 also uh, been a blessing to our criminal justice system because our courts and our jails were already backlogged, so it's freed them up. And like I said, our jails now are being used what they were designed to be used for, and that's not to house people with mental health issues, but people that actually committed a criminal act. So these crisis intervention units now are, are helping those that have mental health issues and uh, getting them the help that they need. When they go to one of those crisis intervention units, they can stay up to 96 hours. It's all voluntary. They've got medical people there to help them. And one of the things that they make sure of when a, when a, a patient leaves that one of those units is, is that they have a follow-up from a, a mental health care provider and also that they have a safe place to go. So I think that what we've really been able to do here in Arkansas I'm just extremely proud of, of my colleagues and the governor and everyone else that's really stepped up and stepped out to make sure that we've led the way and being able to get help to those that really need it. Well, thanks to both of you. I think getting these two different perspectives, two different states is uh, very useful and helpful to our audience. Take care. And that concludes this episode of our podcast. We encourage you to review and rate in CSL Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, or Spotify. We also encourage you to check out our other podcasts, Legislatures, The Inside Story, and the special series, Building Democracy. Thanks for listening. <music>